There you go. All right. That's it, man. Just like everybody else, anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of public opinion. And you can be guilty there before you ever show up. It's usually how it goes. Public opinion. So it's midsummer. Yes, last night. I think last night was Equinox, wasn't it? That yeah. is uh, that is how we typically in the AFA do our uh, annual. That's our year to year, midsummer to midsummer. That's our annual our annual marking of time. And this midsummer last week in the AFA had their big get together. It was 25 years. I think it was the largest one they've ever had. I think it was like 150 people out in California from all over the United States. Next next month uh, in July, they're doing a dedication for the second off, the Thor's off out in North Carolina. And uh, Matt told me today that there's gonna be a, another major announcement this week for the AFA. And that's, uh, I know that people, this thing has been around for 25 years and a lot of people have joined it. People ask me why I'm still a part of it. Well, you know, it's true. I don't like most of some of the people that are in there and they don't like me. I don't usually make any bones about it, but we do get together because something neat is happening there. Something real neat is happening there. I mean, they have, uh, and everybody got upset when Matt started the Hoftoler, but that, that Hoftoler where people pay 1% of their paycheck, dude, that has made such a difference in our ability to do some of the things that the AFA wants to do. It's not even funny. But I got to say, man, I, when Matt came on and, and took over the range of the organization, I came back in because I wanted to support him, but I... I don't know that I realize how successful that bastard would be. He's done a good job. He's pissed me off, and I've pissed him off. That's what brothers do. But he's done a good job with regards to that. And it's going to be something. See, that's the thing that people don't realize today about the AFA. We're not comparing ourselves to the Troth or the Alliance anymore. Now our nearest competition are other major organizations. And it's just getting bigger. It's just getting bigger. But be that as it may, it is midsummer. It is it is the shortening of the days from here on out. We're gonna have a little bit less light. Now there's a story that goes with that from the Lord. And it's one of my very favorites because it it speaks volumes about the journey of men and women in these ideas and avenues of masculinity and femininity so there's it basically starts off with uh balder has a dream he's uh he's much concerned about the foreboding in his future so for Ig, be it who she is his mother and this queen and this wife of odin and the noblest born of, of goddesses she secures from everything a promise not to harm her son now we see that we see that same kind of idea shared in several different venues. We see Achilles, a mother dipping him in the river Styx. Um, and it's, it's repeated. There's several others. I can't remember the other one I wanted to say. Dang it. But it, be that as it may, rest assured that the idea of a mother going to extreme lengths to protect her son never works. It never works. See, a lot of the times for a young man who is trying to become a man, there's the idea of what they call in psychological circles, the idea of a mother complex. Not the mother, not the loving mother, but the mother complex. And more often than not, it's identified as a young man who, or a man, or hell, it could be a 50-year-old man, who would rather kind of enjoy the safety of being around mama than he would be in making a decision to go his own path. And he could still be successful. He could still have, you know, a million dollars in the bank and a great big house and a successful business. Or it might, it might manifest itself as the guy that's always like, hold my beer, watch this. I'll show you how much man I am. But he never makes that decision to kind of separate himself from his mother. He never makes that decision to separate himself from the safety net afforded by his mother's approval 
And that's a, that's a real tricky thing for, a, for young men to figure out. They're always fighting something out there and never really understanding that it's in here of just cutting that apron string, coming off the teat, uh, making a decision that mom doesn't really approve, and then go on and doing it. That's a well-documented kind of, of idea that, that any kind of professional or lay person or, or licensed individual understands when they're dealing with a man who might be having a midlife crisis or a quarter century crisis or may not be performing well in school or anything like that. This is a very real thing. It's one of the biggest hindrances that we have for men who are proclaiming masculinity that they've never dealt with the idea of the mother complex. So this story of Balder, she secures promise from everything except for the mistletoe. Except for the young mistletoe, because it looks so weak and slender, they can, can do no harm. Well, at the thing, as they gather, one of the things they did to kind of show off about how important they were, and everything promised not to hurt Balder, I mean, this is a bad dude. You ain't going to hurt him, you know? They threw all manner of stuff at him, rocks and stones and arrows, and slings and steel. None of it would harm him. And they considered it the most worshipful thing. And it just solidified the value. It was a validation of how important they were in the world. This success, this shining image of a, of a great golden god, Balder, in whose home the fewest baleful runes reside. And he had a wife, Nana. So he's literally born with the golden spoon in his mouth. But he kind of lives up to it. He really kind of steps up to the plate because he secures a marriage and a relationship with Nana that's become very, very important, the strength of it and the success of it. Now, there's another individual in the story, and there always is, and we, feel, we see him dealing with life every day. We, there's always one guy who's got something to say about it, always going to find the bad end, always going to immediately jump to the most negative conclusion because... He either cannot or will not attempt to even try to live up to that. And that was Loki in this case. And that is what I call the uninspired human intellect, the ego run amok. And we see them every day. People with their little bitty egos and how important they think they are. I haven't done a fucking thing, but you know, they've made some good posts online. They're fairly important. Um, It'd be very difficult to take that out. That's the image that we create of ourselves in our mind. Whether or not we've achieved anything or not seems to be irrelevant largely when it comes to the ego because it can take on a life of its own in our own mind and tell us how great we are, whether or not we've accomplished anything. It's very difficult to be honest in the face of that. Loki, in this case, decides to turn into a woman. So he actually changes his physical form and persona to become something he's not to figure out a way to feed his ego and put an end to all this nonsense because he can't do this. Instead of trying to live up, it's like all these guys that are competing as transgenders so they can win. Um, same kind of principle there, same kind of principle. There. We all understand there's something wrong with that, but we can't quite put our finger on it. We can put all kinds of names on it. We can give it all kinds of labels, but it doesn't sit well, it doesn't feel right. And in that confusion, people can convince, well, it's really okay. Nah, she don't feel good about it. But other people will. So he goes to Frigga as a woman, as a hand servant, and says, hey, uh, what's the deal? She tells him the story. She tells him also of the mistletoe. Well, Sugar Bridges breaks straight away, heads for the woods, finding some mistletoe, and finds an arrow. I have another idea about that as well. Because the part of the story we're going to now is, is important on many, many levels. So Loki doesn't really show up in continental Europe. He doesn't really show up until we get into, uh, into Icelandic and, and some of these other later mythologies, or at least that's the, that's the opinion of, of many scholars. And it's always a hotly debated issue. Snorri Sturluson was the presiding judge of the all thing at that time in Iceland, which means he had an innate understanding of how 
these gods and god of these tales and how they relate to the legality of the thing in Iceland every year. Because Balder and Nana's son is Forseti, the one who offers the most favorable judgments, the one from which most Gothis or priests or whatever, or judges at the all thing, derive their authority and hopes to appease by favorable judgments. Snorri snuck off to Norway or Sweden and began to talk to Bishop Olaf and uh, came back and put all these tales on paper. He was lynched for that shit. <laughs> he hid under his bed and they killed him. I had an idea one time that what if this Loki and all the damage that he causes and tears up and what he shows might not also be an aspect of the Pope. Because the first thing he does is once he figures out pretending to be something he's not is goes to the blind man at the edge of the crowd cripple, the low, the downtrodden, you know, to help the sick, to heal the wounded, all of that stuff for which our counterpart is so widely renowned. He approaches the blind man at the edge of the crowd, the one that's ostracized, and he says to him, why don't you participate in these games? Blind Hoder says, well, I'm blind and I have no weapon. Loki says to him, he says, Here's your weapon. Let me guide your shot. Almost like Jesus take the wheel, ain't it? It's kind of a weird thing going on there, but the more I think about it, the more I'm pretty secure in what I'm saying about it. Because with that shot, he kills Baldwin. And he steals, literally steals the sun from the world. Look at the world today. Look at what we're in. Look at it falling down around our ears. Major metropolitan cities that are strongholds of some of these liberal ideologies and thought processes are literally on fire. And now the nights are getting longer. Spiritually, mentally, emotionally, we're losing the sun of the world. We were given something else that showed up on December 25th when the sun, literally the sun, returns kind of hijacked it. <laughs> when Balder fell, the gods fell silent with grief. Everyone was shocked. How could this be? And Frigga wept. But the, the sun had been taken from the world. Their world, particularly. When we see people that take a shot at some other individual, when we spend our lives being told that we may not fit in or we're kind of outside or there's a group of people over there and we take a shot at the guy that is on top, is leading the way because we don't want to measure up or we don't want to try to understand or we don't want to try to become something better and with water cooler gossip and character assassination and the kind of nonsense most people will more than willingly bandy about on social media, they will take a shot at the sun to somebody else's world. Well, you'd be all right to kill that person because they're so, they're, well, they're a criminal. They deserve to die. That person is literally the sun and the shining stars to somebody else in their world. And here we are more than willing to take it when we need to be considered on taking care of each other. Because I don't really care what happens to all these people over there. What I care about are these people to come and spend time with me every Sunday. These people to come and drive for hours and raise a horn with me on Saturday nights. These people that care. Those are the ones I'm concerned about. So we got to pay attention to how many different levels this lore literally speaks to us. A great funeral was planned. Baldur's death, mighty ship with many gifts, fine, his fine horse, and laid him on there, the Gotens and the giants and the light elves and the dark elves and the dwarves and the Aesir and the Vanir. They all attended because things had changed. Things had definitely changed. Now a different, uh, 
now a different path had been is laid out for the gods in their future and people as well. But the ship was so mighty, none could move it. And a great giantess rode up on a savage wolf with a viper as a bridle. Odin sent seven berserkers to handle the wolf. They couldn't contain it, so they slew it and just killed it. There's probably some real important symbolism in that. And Hirakin, the name of the giantess, walked up and with a mighty push, shoved that great funeral pyre ship into the sea on its rollers and the rollers themselves burst into flame. Powerful exertion. One that so frustrated Thor, the warrior's men, as a little dwarf friend in front of him named Leeds, he kicked him into the fire. There's a lesson in that too. Little bastards don't need to be running around on a solemn occasion. This is horseshit. Keep them kids under control. Now the, uh, upon seeing all of this, Anna's heart burst with grief. You have to wonder what kind of man you got to be to love a woman so purely, so strongly, that her heart would cease to beat when you die. What kind of goal might that be? I can assure you that it won't be the kind of guy that, that filters his every interaction with some woman with the lenses of past failures or a woman for that matter, who tints the observations of everything she sees with the failures of her past. Won't ever be a chance for that. Here's the thing, as all of this is going on, Frigg is, she just, that's her son. One of the things about the lore is that it is full of love stories. This is one of the stories of lost love. To bring a bright, shining, good, noble, strong son into the world and then to lose him, I cannot imagine the pain that some of our parents that we know have had to endure. Of these soldiers that die on foreign shores, of these young men that die in the streets of drug overdoses, our people that are suffering because they, they can't figure it out. Our gods have thrown us a lifeline to pull ourselves out of the morass of contemporary thought and value of the things that what everybody told us that was important. But now I no longer have a son. And another tale begins to shape up. She says, is there no hero who's willing to go and barter with hell for the life of my son? Well, Frey's hand servant, Skirnir, is uh, it's a hell of a cat. I'm just gonna tell you, you don't hesitate. Man. And every, he will go and give it a no, it's uh, her modern. That's who it is. Her modern decides to go because this is his brother. Odin gives him Sleipnir and he rides for days and days and days and finally comes to the Gial bridge. There's Gial, and she says, You don't look like the rest that are trying to cross this bridge. What are you doing here? He said, I come to find Balder. She tells him where to go. He spurs Slantnir onward, and he travels across misty dales, and comes to a great wall, and Slantnir leaps it with a single bound, and he lands in the courtyard, and there she is, held herself. The goddess who has the complete collection of all of the knowledge of every ancestor that's passed on. All of their love, their passion, their strength, their weaknesses, everything they know, feel, see, love, taste, and touch. For an ordinary being, even if it is a god, to come find yourself in the face of such awe-inspiring understanding and knowledge, the very embodiment of everything the runes stand for. It's probably gonna be quite intimidating. And he asks, where is my brother? He looks a little bit beyond her, and there he is, sitting in the high seat. Sitting in the high seat as an honored guest. That is there with him. He said, I come to barter for the release of my brother. Um, we'll see about that. So he tarries there overnight, and Balder and Hamad talk about many things. 
And in the morning, when it's time to go, he sends back the armband that belongs to Odin, the great chieftain. And the guild's eight rings just like it. You got to be a heck of a chieftain to hand out, to, to bind eight warriors to yourself every night with an armband. That's a big army. That's a powerful chieftain. That's the kind of guy that can rule the world. He sends it back to his father. It's right for place because he's got a new path. This is a much different path now. And Fuller does something too that's really important to understand that brings the idea of this mother complex full circle. First, she sends back a finger ring to Fuller. And I've always thought that was a very beautiful sentiment for an older sister to send back to a younger sister who might have doubts or concerns, especially if she's going to marry a, a faraway prince or being betrothed to some king of a foreign land to tell her it's gonna be okay. To give your little sister hope and encouragement and support when you're not there. I think that's a very beautiful and touching moment between the love of sisters. And then there's also a homespun linen smock that Balder left home with. Every young man that ventures forth from the home as a young man to slay the dragon of his life who's looking out there somewhere when he should be looking in here. He leaves home in a homespun smock that his mother makes him to protect him from the elements. That's a real important symbol that this God who has accepted his new path, his new challenge, his new role, has really accepted it. He's made a decision to leave behind the comfort and security of, of mama's lap. And it's such an important decision that at the end of all things, after Ragnarok burns it all to the ground, he's the one that returns most suitable for the son to return to the world and take up his father's role and start the cycle anew. These tales, the more we look at them, the more we talk about them. And any one of those subjects, I could probably have written an entire book about. In fact, I have written some about some of them. There's a, uh, there's a lesson for life there that's much deeper than we might understand. And we don't have to pretend that we're seven. In this world, once we begin to take just a basic look and understanding of how humans interact, but more importantly, how they interact with themselves. Are we still craving the comfort of living a mother's lap? Are we still waiting on our fathers to anticipate our thoughts? Are we waiting on our husbands to anticipate our thoughts the way our fathers did before we ever make them? Without telling, are we expecting? There's a lot of things that we can learn from all of this, but as these nights grow longer, and we are all on this new path of also truth, and some of, I don't care if I've been on it a decade or two decades, four decades, are we still embracing those ideas at the beginning of the long nights that allow us to move forward and embrace the path we're on? Because it, on a daily basis, I make good decisions, I make bad decisions. Everybody does. Keep trying to make the good ones. Keep trying to embrace the challenge of the future. Keep trying to embrace stepping up to the plate and really see where you're going and what you can contribute and what you can become. That's my midsummer message. Any questions? Well, then we all should be entitled to Norfolk the Garthak at your leisure. And I hope you have a wonderful Monday. Grab life by the nose and flip its ass. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Brian.